This is High Stakes from Girard Inc. I'm David Schiffrin with Girard Inc. This is the second in our New Year's series where we asked each of our five practice leads the same set of questions about what happened in 2023 and what to watch for in 2024. This week we are running two of those interviews back to back. The first is with Letitia Fetcher, Senior Vice President and the leader of our public and community health system practice. This team serves independent and government owned hospitals, practices and medical centers at the community level. Then it's James Cervantes, Senior Vice President and Regional Health System Practice Lead. James's group provides counsel to hospitals serving a geographic region larger than a single city or community. If you want to learn more about either of these practices, the work they do, and the clients that they serve, check out gerardinc.com forward slash practices. That's J-A-R-R-A-R-D-I-N-C dot com forward slash practices. So Letitia, let's start off with just looking back at 2023. And as you think about your clients across the board, what do you feel was the biggest sort of collective win uh, for the clients in your practice? I mean, it, it's been a tough year for healthcare overall, right? There's a lot of issues that have popped up from payer relations to financial issues to workforce recruitment and retention. But I think at the end of the day with community hospitals and rural hospitals, especially this past year, is that they saw that their employees are more engaged with them more now than ever. We no longer are relying on the travelers. We're no longer relying on temporary labor back to our core folks who are engaged with our leadership and who want to be there for their patients and community. What about the the flip side of that? What do you see their biggest couple of challenges being looking into next year? You know, how rural and community hospitals are paid is always an issue. And so negotiations with payers continues to be something that's on the forefront of their minds and their hospital associations that support them in in every state are thinking about that as well. Also, with rural and community hospitals, about half of them are still independent. And knowing that they can't do this alone, not with the financial pressures, not with the way they're being reimbursed from commercial and government payers, a lot have realized that they need to enter into some sort of unique partnership, whether that be a full acquisition or a merger of equals with another community hospital that is um, generally in their area. So exploring with their board of directors and the leadership team what they actually look like in the next year or two or three, and whether that is solely an independent healthcare provider or do they explore partnership opportunities that can give them more le- leverage with those payers, that can give them more leverage um, with benefits for, for their employees so they can continue to be financially sound and operationally sound uh, into the long term? What about focusing specifically on communications? What do you see being the biggest challenge or opportunity that, that public and community hospitals are looking at? Honestly, I think it's the same issues that we've always dealt with. And we would say that people working from home have different needs and communication, ways that they're communicated with than than others. But we've always dealt with employees who are not engaged, uh, like nurses. And when I say not engaged, I mean they're not in front of a computer where they have direct access to email communications. And so I think it's more than anything that our leaders, from a communication perspective, have to take ownership of the fact that they are also communicators. And what does that mean? And it it may mean that they need to get out of their offices, that they need to get out in front of their screens and be purposely engaging with folks from those who are working at the bedside to those who are working from home. And there's got to be more one-on-one engagement to make sure that we have that direct face-to-face time because what we we learned through the pandemic was, yeah, we can do virtual for a while and it's not like that's going away anytime soon, but people still crave that interaction, whether that's over the screen or in person. 
And we can't only be relying on newsletters and emails and our intranet sites to be doing all the communicating for us. So you talked about the challenge, the communications challenges being largely the same. Do you see anything, whether communications or otherwise around partnerships, any hints that 2024, you know, is it just another turning the page on the calendar or do you think this next year or so is going to look different in any way for your clients? I think every year is different. <laughs> Honestly, I think that they are always faced with having to make changes and tough choices. And how do we communicate in an impactful way that changes will always be part of who we are? And some of those changes can be good for the benefit of our patients. And some of those changes may not feel so great to our employees. But the fact that we can't ever say that this is a one and done, we're constantly evolving. So how do we communicate as a health system that we're constantly evolving, whether that be a partnership, which is a very big deal, to some operational tweaks that makes us more financially sound, to recruiting more specialists or providers, but continuing to communicate what we're doing as a health system to constantly evolve, to be able to meet the needs of our community that may look different than it did last year and the year before and the year before that. We no longer can operate as health systems like we did 75 years ago when we were founded. We have got to evolve faster. We are the slowest industry when it comes to evolving how we operate and do business. And we're in a people business. We should be moving faster. And how do we use technology and other things to make sure that we are evolving and communicating that we're evolving faster? So with those challenges and then the need to evolve faster, communicate faster, you're in a room with an executive team and you're trying to figure out what to do next to evolve. What's the question that you as an advisor ask to help the leadership team get unstuck or make the decision, whatever that next step might need to be? I think that's an interesting question because what we counsel our communications leads clients on is that communications can't drive operational decisions but we can certainly be part of those conversations to make sure that we're communicating operational decisions in the right way. And so I would say that just being in those conversations is, is half the battle. And to get them unstuck would be, well, what are the solutions that we're providing? We're making this operational change. Thanks for bringing in communications. But what are we doing to provide solutions and having the, them talk through that whether or not we have all the answers right away in that room. But we need to be able to communicate not only a change, but what we're doing to make that change less of, a, of an issue for our patients or for our employees. That's where we can shift the narrative from we're an organization that's just making changes to make changes to we're making these changes for the benefit of our patients. And this is what we're doing to make sure that change doesn't feel quite as impactful or feel harmful in any way. And I think communications can help drive those types of decisions without getting in the way of an operational change, but helping them think through how we do roll this out in a way that, that makes sense. So turning a little bit, what have you seen that, whether it's from within or, or outside of healthcare, that your clients could learn Where's the cross-pollination coming from that you think hospitals might be able to use? I'm going to shift your question great. because I think there's always things to be learned from other industries, and I think that's great that we pay attention to those things. I think we need to ask our employees. Instead of trying to just learn from these big retailers like at Amazon or trying to figure out how we can shoehorn AI into what we're doing from a process or a communications aspect, we need to just ask our employees in our community, how are we perceived today? And what do you want from us? What do you need from us? And I think more than anything that sets the bar with our employees that we care to even ask for your opinion. And we also care enough to implement your ideas. And I know we need to be careful there a little bit when it comes to what they're going to say is they want more pay and to work less. But that's the, the low-hanging fruit. But if we can demonstrate that we are asking for their opinion, that we care about how they feel, we care about our reputation to them and our community, that's we need to do way more listening than ever before. And then also not only listening, but engaging and, and making sure that 
the people who are taking care of our people are part of our vision for the future. Do you have any examples of clients who have done that really well recently? And you don't have to name anybody or extending the broadening the question a little bit, anybody who's taken a different, put a different spin on things, an unconventional approach to going back to the idea of getting unstuck or making some progress with community or employee engagement? Yeah, I have a client that was going through a partnership exploration and they hadn't chosen a partner. They hadn't even, they were just really in the early process and they announced that they were going to look for a partner or make the decision to remain independent. They didn't know what kind of partnership it would be. They didn't know if it would be a full acquisition, but they just announced to the community and their employees that they're going to start really thinking about that as an option for their future. And then they did listening sessions with their employees and the community, and they sent a survey internally and externally just to say, these are the top 10 things that we determined as a board and a leadership team that we want to make sure are things that we preserve and things that would be being a partner, good culture fit, those types of things. And we had our employees and our doctors and our providers and our community weigh in on, well, do you think this is the right list? Rank this list. What are the most important things for you? And we got their feedback on what it was that we were looking for in a partner and what it was that we wanted to preserve at the end of the day, we could use that to say, you said these top three things were the most important for you. That's what we're going to make sure that we preserve and, and is part of this exploration process. So not only were we able to use it when we looked for a partner, but we were also able to say, okay, this is what you told us, and we're actually listening, and this is going to be part of it. Thank you for being part of the process. That was almost two years ago. Since then, they found a partner, they've been acquired, they've been going through integration now for about six months, and they still say that was the single most important part of the entire process for them to make sure that they got it right. Awesome. Thanks, Letitia. I appreciate it. So James, let's start off with kind of the big picture. As you look across the conversations that you had this year, what, what do you feel like was the biggest win collectively in 2023 for for clients in the regional practice? As I think about the regional health systems across the U.S. in the clients that we work with, I think their biggest win in what we saw was this commitment to their workforce, reinvesting in their people, in nurses, physicians, employees, organizations focused on creating environments that are more inclusive, that are more focused on belonging. COVID was really difficult for a lot of these health systems. And I think what we what we saw in 2023 was a concerted effort to prioritize their people in their workforce. So uh, that was a lot of work that we did. And it was great to see that commitment at the highest level of these organizations. Flipping that around then, what about the top challenges, you know, top one, two, three challenges that they're facing? I think the, the number one challenge for regional health systems continues to be just the heavy headwinds coming out of COVID and that are going to continue, I think, into 2024. So 2023 was a very challenging year financially for a lot of regional health systems. You saw many with declining operating margins, and a lot of them have had to make hard decisions and choices around cutting costs and doing things differently and, and behaving differently at the operational level. And so I think we will continue to see that into 2024, though they will be, I think, more prepared knowing what 2023 brought. Focusing specifically down into our world of communications, what are you seeing in terms of the communications opportunities, challenges, kind of however you want to frame it as we turn the page into 2024? Sure. I think internally, the, the communication challenges uh, continue to be how we are reaching our, our specific audiences in our different employee groups. During COVID, we communicated in a very different way. In 2023, I think was the first year from that where we said how we communicated during COVID is not sustainable. What do we need to be doing differently going forward to reach our unique audiences? The one that comes to mind particularly is the physician audience. A lot of these health systems have grown their physician base or are working with other partners to bring physicians into their network yet they continue to struggle with how to communicate with them and to them and stay in front of them and keep them informed and engaged. I think that will continue to be a challenge in 2024. Externally, I think 
there are two things uh, that I think will continue to be a, a challenge for our regional health systems in 2024. One is addressing the continued anti-hospital rhetoric that we're seeing play out across uh, a number of different medium mediums today and how these health systems are positioning themselves within their communities, within their states, and even nationally. The second is, I think, and related to that is how you're differentiating yourself in the market. So we're seeing continued M&A activity. These regional health systems have, have grown over the last few years through acquisition, through partnership, and they need a very strong, sharp value proposition and how they're different than the competitor down the road or the academic medical center up the street or the smaller community hospital that people may be more familiar with. Those, I think, are the two challenges externally in addition to reaching your audiences internally. So as you think about the new year, the challenges for sort of positioning regional health systems in their market and, and even as part of the national conversation with all the scrutiny, you've got executive teams that are looking at a lot of work that needs to be done, a lot of headwinds, a lot of financial challenges. If you, as an advisor to these executive leaders, walk into a meeting, what is the question that you can ask to help them make the right next decision to make the move or get unstuck and start to address whatever challenges may be coming in the new year? Yeah, it's a great question, David. So for a lot of these regional health systems, they are on a calendar. Their calendar year coincides with the fiscal year. And so January is often the turning of the page. It's a new chapter for these organizations. And so we're often advising our clients to embrace that moment and start the year strong and do things differently than what you did the year before that didn't work. So to your question, the question that I would be asking and that we're asking these executives today is, what's the tone that we want to set for 2024 across the organization? And the second question to that is, what will prevent us from getting there? What's going to stand in our way? What are our barriers from achieving that vision or that tone that we want to set at the organizational executive level? I think the follow-up to that especially if we're in a a group among an executive team is how are we accountable and what are we going to be doing specifically to drive that down through the organization? And how are we going to set that tone at this level, at the executive level, all the way down to our staff at the front line? James, what about new models or evolved models, partnerships, different ways that regional systems can or are thinking about, again, their role within the larger healthcare ecosystem and how they can kind of interact with other healthcare organizations, things that they can learn and ways that they can partner? Yeah, it's a great question. So we are seeing a lot of these regional health systems smartly invest and partner with non-traditional healthcare provider organizations. These are systems that their bread and butter needs to continue to be delivering care in their communities that they serve, right? That, That will not change. But in order to enhance their revenue streams, in order to combat some of the financial challenges that they're going to continue to face, they need to diversify. That's the reality. That's one part. The second part is they need to respond to the environment that we're in today as it relates to what consumers are wanting and needing from any organization, including their healthcare provider. That looks different for each system. And I think each regional system is figuring out what their portfolio looks like and and what they can do to meet their consumer needs while also addressing their financial needs. So it it is a two-part play, and I think a lot of these regional health systems are smartly trying to figure out what that combination looks like. Do you have any examples of of any clients or or systems that you've seen in the past year or so who have taken an unconventional or a creative approach to solving some of these problems? Some organizations are setting up subsidiary companies within their overall brand name, And that subsidiary or that part or segment of their organization is hyper-focused on exactly what you're describing. Smart investments, JVs, partnerships that are taking the organization outside of their traditional model of care and finding ways to invest in partnerships. So we're seeing at one organization, they stood up a separate enterprise arm of their organization that is a wholly owned company that is part of their broader name but exists mostly separately. And they, as part of that effort, have developed different type of physician partnerships. So they're looking at ways where we don't want to employ physicians or we don't need to, but we do want to partner with them. And so there's an arm of their organization that is figuring out 
different employment models for physicians. And that's, I think, one example um, that has been effective for that organization that I wouldn't be surprised to see others do in 2024. Okay. Moving into the last couple of questions, a little bit more blue sky. Anything that your clients have picked up from outside of healthcare that has been helpful, either operationally, things that they've implemented, or just ways of thinking about their work, whether that's coming from retail or, I don't know, travel and hospitality, whatever it might be. Yeah, it's interesting. Years ago, probably 2030 now, there was a large effort around lean methodology, lean thinking, and there were a few regional health systems and even other medical centers that were bringing lean into their organizations. And you heard about some organizations leaning into the lean methodology, right? That seemed to be a soup du jour at the moment. And I think we saw some success with organizations, but it, it proved to be unsustainable. I think what some of these regional health systems are doing right now and thinking about is is less a specific methodology and an overall behavior change and how we can just be more flexible and agile in the way that we operate on a day-to-day basis. So what does that mean? It means empowering all levels of your organization to problem solve, to innovate, to ideate, and to have an active role in managing their specific area from supplies and budgets and finances to delivering care. So I think we're going to continue to see that in 2024. That is one ingredient to making these regional health systems successful going forward is no decisions can no longer just exist at the executive level. There needs to be almost a a cultural shift change in, in the behavior management and leadership at every level of the organization. And so I think that is one thing that we've seen effective in other industries, this sort of agile way of leading decision-making that is is going to be used more so within these healthcare providers. Another theme that we're seeing regional health systems consider in 2023 that I think we'll continue to see in 2024 is around this idea of outsourcing and moving some of your non-healthcare delivery work to an outside entity. And so we're seeing a lot of these regional health systems consider that as a financial lever to getting them to be A, more focused on the delivery of care and B, offloading some of the, quite frankly, expenses that they maintain when they have a a broad portfolio of, of business work. So areas like revenue cycle and supply chain, we are seeing a lot of regional health systems consider that outsourcing model that we know exists in other industries and apply that to healthcare. And I think those will continue to be conversations in 2024. Okay, great. 